We got a speaker series today. I'd like to introduce, uh, real quick, we're going to start up in a moment here. I'd like to introduce Evan Shapiro from O1 Labs. Uh, this is the team that's building out the CODA protocol. So we're very excited to welcome Evan to the stage here. Um, CODA is a Coinbase Ventures portfolio company, and we're going to be talking to Evan about the inspiration behind CODA, what it is, how it works, and the sort of innovative things that it's bringing into this space. So why don't we all just start with a nice warm welcome for Evan. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Love it. That's great. Um, by the way, I'm Justin. Those of you who don't know me, uh, I work on our corporate development team and on the ventures team, and very excited to chat with you today, Evan. Uh, I thought we'd start, actually, just by introducing you more formally. So um, Evan has uh, graduated from Carnegie Mellon. He has a bachelor in science and computer science, um, and he also obtained his research master's degree while working in the Carnegie Mellon Personal Robotics Lab, where he did some research on a really cool robotics platform. Um, after that, uh, he also worked as a software engineer for Mozilla. And about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, he co-founded O1 Labs. As mentioned, that's uh, responsible for building out the Coda protocol. And you received seed equity and a funding round from some pretty impressive names in the space, Metastable Capital, Electric Capital, Polychain, um, an AngelList novel, Ravikant, and also Coinbase Ventures. Um, and uh, so you are the CEO of O1 Labs, and welcome. Thank you, yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. So I think I'd start out, just want to get more I want to get to know you a little bit more. So could you give me a little bit of uh, your background in uh, your, your personal background and, and then how you got into cryptocurrency? Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. So yeah, so my background is in like computer science. I went to CMU and I did like a computer science undergrad. And after that, as you mentioned, I uh, did a master's at that point in robotics. Uh, we were doing a lot of work with like uh, basically motion planning. So if you have like a robot that has like an arm with like a lot of joints in it, how do you like, you know, move that around in a good way? So that was fun to do. Um, after that, I moved out here and at a similar time, uh, one of my friends from high school, Izzy Meckler, moved out here to do a PhD at uh, Berkeley in cryptography. And we just spent a lot of time just like thinking about and like working on projects together. And one thing we really just started digging into was cryptocurrency. Um, in particular, like this was early 2017, and we saw all these new projects coming up, Ethereum, et cetera, and they were all awesome, and they all had like, these great visions behind them. We were really excited to see what they could do, but we saw like this kind of mismatch between where the hype was and where the technology was at the time. And we were thinking, like, what could we build or what could we do that would like, kind of improve, or what could we like, build that would be you know, a good addition to the space? And that's when we started thinking about base layer protocols and what they look like and what their constraints are and how they're built and what could be possible if you remove some of the limitations on them. And it was really that summer that we started like just kind of building a protocol. And so we did that for like four or five months before like going to raise funding. So you basically just jumped straight into building a protocol. There was no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no interim period, yeah. Most people, it's yeah. funny, you know, when I talk to most people about cryptocurrency, they all, you know, it's all some magical weird thing they don't quite understand. They get involved in it by looking at the prices, finally get an asset and learn about it. For you, it was the technology that, that appealed to you at first. Yeah, we, we have been following, like, since Bitcoin, like, in high school, actually, in, like, 2011 or so. Um, and, and I don't know, I just always found the technology very fascinating that you could, like, do this algorithm that usually is, like, requires Paxos and it's very complicated with proof of work, with like cryptocurrency, it was like awesome. Okay, awesome. So let's actually think about Coda now. So you did decide to build a layer one foundational blockchain. Um, as mentioned, Coinbase Ventures has is, is, is participated in your seed round. Um, this is a really, really cool technology, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more about the inspiration for exactly, you know, why did you decide to build Coda specifically, and can you talk about what Coda is? Totally. So. When we were looking at this problem of, okay, like, what is a base layer protocol? What does it look like? What is it? What are the components of it? The, the thing that kept coming back was you have to verify the chain. You have to download it and access it if you want to, like, be a first, part, first class member on the chain. And we had both run full nodes, and we knew, like, this, this was something that is, uh, you know, pretty significant with today's technology because you have to download the whole chain. And if you look at modern cryptocurrencies today, they're on the order of hundreds of gigabytes, which just takes a few days to download, and then you have to be online afterwards to like, continue to download it. And, and this, 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 is, this kind of sucks if you like, want to run a cryptocurrency, because there's like, this huge like, upfront cost in downloading it, and it's only going to get bigger as more transactions are added. So that was what kind of inspired us to really dig into this problem of block size, which is where Coda is making an innovation. 
Let's, let's actually see if we can crystallize this just a little bit. Um, what I find really fascinating, again, is this idea of a succinct blockchain. We're, we're actually compressing the size of it to a pretty significant degree. We'll get into that in a moment, how it all works. But real quick, show of hands, how many of you guys today run your own full node on any blockchain out there? We got one, one brave soul. Yeah, OK. So I think this highlights, though, that all of us are interacting with these blockchains through some third party. We're not native trustless participants in these blockchains. And that is a bit of a problem when we think about how this is going to remain decentralized and how we're going to actually still create apps and, and projects built on top of these things if everybody has to use third party services. This is the core, I think, tenant to Coda and what you're trying to solve for. Um, so I, I think. This is a really technical topic, by the way. Coda is doing some really groundbreaking things with CK Snarks in particular. Um, and so I want us to go a little bit technical. I want us to talk about how it works. I want to make it accessible. But let's start with seeing if you can explain Coda succinctly. <laughs> Notice the pun there. Yeah, succinctly. OK. OK, let's try it. So usually when you have a cryptocurrency and you want to use it and you want to verify it, you have to download all the blocks in the blockchain. So this is like a download you do, and then you have all the data. Great. So. If there are, you know, like uh, more blocks being added to the blockchain, the blockchain gets longer and longer and longer. So let's think for a second about what a blockchain is for. What is it actually doing? Well, what it's doing is providing a proof that some state of the world is like the real state of the world and the strongest state of the world. Some database, some ledger is the real ledger. So then we can ask, why does that proof have to be, you know, n blocks long? Isn't there some way to make it shorter somehow? And the answer is yes. The answer is you can use zero knowledge proofs to create a very, very small proof of the current state of the database. In fact, a proof that's both A, constant size, and B, only a few kilobytes. And so once you have that, you don't need to hold around this whole blockchain anymore. You just need to hold the current state of the database and this proof that the database is what you want it to be. And to be fair, uh while every participant gets this very succinct proof of the blockchain, somebody else has to have the entire history of transactions, correct? So not, not quite. So um, they can optionally hold that. And then you know it's the same as any other blockchain. They can look at the whole history if they want to. But to be a consensus node, all you have to do is hold on to the current state of the blockchain, which means you only have to hold on to all the current account balances at whatever the current time is. And if that changes, you can throw away what the old data was. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so before we get actually into the really technical side of things, this core tenant of creating a succinct blockchain, um, can you talk about what that's enabling that current blockchains are kind of struggling with? What's yeah, so, the end use case? Totally. So I mean, we just talked about one, one briefly, which was like if you want to download a full node, that takes like days now. When you have a succinct blockchain, you can download a full node instantly. And, and there's a lot of implications to what that means. Um, one is that usually in cryptocurrency, there's like this tension between scaling a blockchain and the decentralization of a blockchain. If, if you look at like Bitcoin, for example, they've kept their block size very low because they want to keep it maximally decentralized. The connection here is that if the block size was to be larger, you'd be adding onto the blockchain more and more data, and it would grow in size faster and faster. So you don't want to make the block size too large with the traditional blockchain. But once your blockchain's constant size, you can make your block size as big as you want, really as big as the network can handle. And because it just gets kind of folded into like this tiny little zero knowledge proof, it doesn't impact the decentralization of the chain, which is um, a, a big advantage you get because you can have both throughput and decentralization. So how exactly does a succinct blockchain achieve scale and throughput? Can you walk through that process? Yeah, so um, right. So let's think about what is throughput. Throughput is just the number of transactions you're adding to the blockchain per unit time, which is really the block size. Because if you have a block size that's you know, uh, every increasing block every minute, and you double the block size, you've doubled the throughput. So usually that would be bad, because you're increasing the rate at which the blockchain grows, which is bad for decentralization. But with Coda. Once you have a block that has all these transactions in it, and you turn that block into a new zero knowledge proof, you don't need to keep the block anymore. You have the new zero knowledge proof of the new database. So that means that you can make the block size very large, and your proof stays the same size. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, so actually, let's, let's dive in now a little bit. So ZK Snarks, this is like magic blockchain technology. It's, like, it's, it's literally like crypto magic, right? Uh, cryptography magic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I've, I've tried to understand ZK Snarks a few times. Uh, I do have a mathematical background. This stuff is very opaque to me even as well. Um, because this is such a central part of the Coda protocol, I'm wondering if you could take a moment and maybe explain exactly how ZK Snarks work and how they function, and actually how do they end up creating it a, a very succinct small blockchain. Sure, let's do it. So 
there's a few, I guess, levels at which we could explain zero knowledge proofs. Let me start with something that's like very slightly technical and then I'll bring it back to something that's like an, an analogy that's pretty um, understandable. So if you imagine you want to like run a computation, usually you have to, and you want to know what the result of that computation is, usually you have to run it yourself. You have to like, you know, tell your computer, okay, I got these inputs, let's see what the outputs are going to be, let's see if it actually matches what we expect. A zero knowledge proof lets us do something a little different, which is that instead of running the program yourself, somebody else can run the program, somebody random on the internet, and give you a little proof, and then you know that if you had run the program yourself, you would get the same result as the proof is telling you you would get. So this is great because with a blockchain, instead of like having to um, run the computation of checking the whole blockchain, you can just check the little zero knowledge proof which stands in for that computation. And if you want to take it away from technical things, uh, one way to kind of think about this is let's say that like I had like, you know, um, a, a giant boulder and I wanted to prove to you that I knew that it existed. One thing I could do is like take you to see the giant boulder or haul the boulder around with me to like show you it. But another thing I could do maybe is take a photo of, of that boulder and then I could show you the picture. And because you can see it in the picture, you believe it exists. And this is kind of what a zero knowledge proof is. It's like a little proof that something actually exists and you don't have to like look at the actual thing because the proof fully explains its existence. So yeah. this is a yeah this is a really interesting idea. Um, it, essentially, we we use these zero knowledge proofs to essentially wrap the state of the blockchain in a very very small little piece of data. It's a recursive proof though. So how does the recursive element function in your blockchain? Right. So if you imagine that every time we added new data to the blockchain, a new block, we had to recompute this proof. It would be really bad because. When the blockchain's 10 long, maybe that's a proof that's you know, size 10. But when the blockchain's at 10,000 long, now your proof is huge, it's 10,000. So you need a way to be able to, every time you update the blockchain, to do a constant amount of work in doing that update. And that's where the recursion comes in. We can take, let's say that we want to do an update to a blockchain. We take the existing blockchain so far, the Coda blockchain, you know, 5,000 blocks in. And we look at the proof we had for that. And we take that proof, we compose it with a proof saying that the data we want to add to the proof is also correct. So now we have a proof that we had a blockchain of length 5,000 that's good. We have a new block that's good to add to that. Now we can create a new proof that's length 5,001. So because you're like updating this proof recursively, it's very cheap to do so, relatively cheap to do so. So I don't know if there's actually a really simple way to explain this, because it does have to be very technical, because we're dealing with CK Snarks here. Um, the way that I conceptualize this, though, is essentially, uh, yeah, we have this recursive uh, proof on proof on proof on proof. And so anytime somebody new needs to get onboarded into the Coda ecosystem, all they need to get is the current recursive proof that encodes within that proof in a zero knowledge way that there actually stands a blockchain behind it that's linked together by all the other blocks and it encodes, their, their, and it encodes the Merkle root of the transactions such that there, we know that there is a ledger somewhere and all of this is mathematically proven and verified. Yes, and maybe one way to explain this actually would be um if you had like a photo of a photo of a photo of a photo where each photo is includes in the photo a photo of like the previous blockchain with like the thing you're adding to it. So you have like this recursive like tunnel of photos going all the way back to the genesis. Reminds me of turtles all the way down, right? Turtles all the way, <laughs> to the genesis block, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so uh, when we think about what this means for the end user, I mean, we started this conversation a little bit, I asked you guys how many of you are running full nodes on any blockchain? Not a lot. Because full nodes today on any other blockchain is very hard to do. You have to have the entire history. You have to have that history rolling forward. Every single state change as it is applied each block. With Coda, you just need one very small piece of data that contains within it a proof that there exists a blockchain standing behind it. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about scalability. But when we talk about the impact for the end user, it's a little more than that. Because not only is this proof constant size, it's also just extremely, extremely small. It's on the order of a few kilobytes. So. If you're a user that has like, you know, using a web browser, or using like um, a mobile phone, you can get the full blockchain on that device, um, you know, basically instantly, which is great because if you're like a user, you don't think about what third party you're going to trust anymore because you can just have your device directly connect to the blockchain, to the network, and make sure it has like the strongest chain and make sure it has the real state of the data of the world. And similarly, if you're a developer, you don't have to think about building the infrastructure to connect your user's like, application, their user devices to the blockchain, because your user's device can just do it on your application's behalf. It can just connect to the blockchain by itself. So what, do you, what sort of applications do you envision coming out of this? Yeah, like the, most thing, the thing I'm most excited about for is uh, just building something that like, a developer or like, someone who's a builder or like, an end user can just like, quickly access and quickly build something new for. And then in particular, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, one application just being 
taking like basically digital money store like you know digital value and like being able to embed that in applications and build new applications with it really easily. And when I think about that, one thing that I think I'm really excited to exist more of is like applications that involve coordinating large numbers of users. Like you can imagine like a website where like there's like a lot of people going on the website, they're all connected to the blockchain directly through Coda, and they can all like, uh, you know, send money to like different things that they care about. Maybe almost like you can think about like a reverse Kickstarter sort of where people like are pulling very small amounts of money to like try to make something they all care about happen. Um, so things like that where we're just like coordinating lots of people with like small amounts of money or with like medium amounts of money, I, I think would be really exciting. That's awesome. So we did want to take this a little bit technical because that is, I think, core to, to Coda protocol. Um, I have a couple of questions about the implications behind building a succinct blockchain and using ZK Snark. So one of the questions that I have, it's, it's a pretty common uh, critique, I think, for, for projects that are using ZK Snarks. Um, I've heard this before, really curious to hear your thoughts on it, but essentially it goes like this. ZK Snarks are like really novel new cryptography magic, and they're relatively new on the scene. Um, and so it's generally preferred to use cryptographic methods that are very well known and battle tested because they've been around for a long time. And you're more confident that we know the boundaries of the system. When you get to ZK Snarks, they're very new, coupled with the fact that there's only a few experts in the world that really know them front to back. So I'm just curious, should we be concerned at all that at some point down the road, somebody might be able to find a novel way to poke at it or break it? Like, how should we think about that risk? So, so as far as like cryptographic systems go, Snarks are like pretty well battle tested. I, I think just because like they're so novel and so powerful, people are just kind of like, whoa, like what is this at first? But like the, all the cryptography and math behind it's like super solid. And they've actually been around for a while now. It's just only the last few years they've become efficient enough where you've been able to like, um, you know, do like real computation in the real world. They used to just be super, super slow. So it's really about the speed advancements which have made them kind of come up to like kind of public knowledge versus like them just being brand new or anything. They, they've been around and I'm excited from people think about it in the same way they think about like, you know, public key cryptography or hashing where like you don't necessarily know all the details of why like hashing works, but like, you know, it's battle tested and you believe it works. I think snarks are the same way and I think it'll like be more clear how that is soon. Yeah, um, and so one, also one of the, the key innovations that, that you're kind of battling through here is how do you make snarks computationally efficient? And you mentioned that a little bit there, that traditionally using any sort of ZK snark takes a lot of computational power, and that has constraints and limits on really what you can do with the system and, and what sort of people can operate within it. So how does this, you know, how are you speeding it up, and how does it impact maybe the developer experience? So, so the, there's, there's a few things going on here. The, the, the biggest one is that when you make the decision of what cryptographic primitives to use in your protocol, different cryptographic primitives like hash functions and public key cryptography, are, are more efficient inside of snarks um, than others. So if you look at like something like Bitcoin, for example, the hash scheme and signature scheme it uses would be less efficient inside of a snark. But if you change the parameters on which elliptic curves you're using and which hash functions you're using, you can find choices that are very efficient inside of snarks. And then you can make it work pretty well. Okay, last technical question. So if we do have to kind of constrain the, the ways in which we're using ZK snarks so that they're all efficient, um, does this mean that people who are developing on Coda, building these apps, do they have to use libraries or languages that also conform to like the boundaries of this ZK Snark system, and does that impact them at all? So it seems like so far every uh, everything you'd want to do in the normal world like has an alternative in, ZK, in a zero knowledge proof that's like you know just as good uh, basically. Like if you want to do SHA, there's an alternative um, that's just as good inside of a zero knowledge proof. So so not really. Um, if you think about like how you actually are going to be coding zero knowledge proofs, there's like kind of two ways to think about it with Coda particularly. One is you can write like kind of raw zero knowledge proof code in, um, in this programming language we wrote, Snarky. Or the other one is you, we can write a Snarky program which acts as a virtual machine for an assembly language that you then write, um, which then gets compiled by a recursive Snark, but the assembly language you can compile to from any language you want. So, so hopefully there's some ways we can we can make this much better. Yep, got it. Yeah, it won't be like closed just to like zero knowledge proof writing or anything. It'll be any it'll be anything you want. That's awesome. Okay, so I think that's as technical as I want to take it. I want to zoom back out now. Um, the technical piece is honestly like a lot of it's over my head to be honest with you. <laughs> when I read your white paper, by the way, it's very opaque with so much math, but <laughs> it, you know it's good to have. <laughs> um, let's actually let's kind of kind of make a, a transition here, and I want to talk about um, just you as a founder uh, personally. Um, you know. What's your five-year aspiration for Coda? Uh, what do you want to see happen over the next few years specifically, and, and how's, that, how's that looking? Uh, let's, let's see. So I, I, five years is a lot. I want to see a lot happen in five years. So um, 
it, it, maybe like in the next few years, I want to see like basically people developing for and building things with cryptocurrency that a people like ki kind of uh, can get excited about and use and can have like a large user base behind it. And it's using crypto cryptography and cryptocurrency in like a novel way. It's not like recreating things from the old financial system. It's building something that's like new and fun and exciting for people. Um, and after I think I've, we've started to see that happen, and there's been like growth amongst people who are already into cryptocurrency or you know try new applications on the internet, I want to see that kind of transition into having an impact for people that like really use the financial cr transparency that a cryptocurrency provides. Like the current system is like you know pretty opaque, and like it's not been possible to just like kind of create a new thing. Um, and I, I'm really excited to see cryptocurrency and something like Coda hopefully have an impact there as we can just kind of build like new fair transparent systems. Yes, it's interesting. You're mentioning financial transparency, huge deal. On the other hand, I note that other protocols that are building on ZK Snarks are all using it for privacy as a primitive. In this case, it's not privacy. It's for creating a succinct blockchain. Do you have plans to make any element of Coda privacy preserving or privacy as maybe a first class citizen? Yeah, I think privacy is like super important and it's something that we want to add down the line. So what we have working for us so far is that like zero knowledge proofs are already kind of like first class um, primitives on the protocol. So it's not that hard to like, just as you can like recursively verify a new block, recursively verify a private transaction. So um, the core like, you know, doing this recursive composition of zero knowledge proofs is for succinctness, but at some point we hope to add privacy as well. Okay, awesome. Uh, let me ask just a, a personal question. Um, what sort of challenges have you faced in trying to build in layer one a cryptocurrency? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think maybe the biggest thing here is just like, there's like this whole stack of things that we have to be thinking about all the time. Like everything from like, okay, like, you know, uh, are we writing like a, a secure protocol to like, who is going to use this? Like, uh, how are people gonna get access to this technology? What is like the UX going to look like? And I think like kind of seeing that whole stack and like keeping it in your head at the same time is like a huge challenge. It's something that's been like really fun for us to think through and like outline and lay out. Um, so that's like a, that's a fun. Yeah. Are, are there anything that's like a, a significant risk that you see or like what, what's top of your mind when you think about how to make this really successful and get developers and users and people actually utilizing this new technology? I, I think there's like a level of polish I want to like attain for what we're doing. Where, where like I think about like some libraries I use where it's like okay like I'm in the GitHub it's just like time to like you know poke my way around till I figure it out versus like some things which are just like there's like you know an online toolbox or something I can just get started, and, and I really think about like that sort of polished UX is something that we have to really get right because we have to like it's important to me anyway that we build an experience that people can wrap their heads around and really just kind of dive into without any hurdles. Yeah, so when you think about a roadmap then for the Coda protocol, what's it look like? Um, I kind of I want to know the, the whole story. Like, when is it launching? Like, <laughs> what's yeah. the stage to get there? But the other piece of it, too, is really important. Like, you're talking about a polished UX, making it easier for people to really get onboarded to the system. It's a challenge to building in layer one, right? You need to have all these little disparate aspects buttoned up in a really, really polished way. Um, so what does that roadmap look like? Yeah. And, and where are you today? So, so to touch on the, the, the last part very briefly, like, I, I think that because we're able to like build like this like you know full node that runs anywhere it kind of simplifies how we can develop things because every platform gets like the same treatment and also like every platform kind of like handles the whole like infrastructure and backend by itself so that helps a little bit in making like a better UX because we don't have to think about all these like middleware and all these other components in the middle that's probably one of the key uh, benefits to Coda right is we're actually getting rid of that middleware between yeah. developers and users yeah exactly um, and then, so it's going into a roadmap now. So um, the, the plan is that hopefully there will be like a public testnet soon. And then as we like launch that public testnet and as we battle test the network and as we add any features we want to make sure we add before we can launch, um, we'll also be like bringing developers on board to be starting to build little projects on Coda as well as like um, making sure that like, you know, we've properly gone out and added everything everyone wants to our protocol. Um, so that's that's kind of the plan, I guess, towards launch. Do you have any like hopeful date for a mainnet launch? I, I mean, I'm hoping the test net's ask. going to come out like the, the next few months, and then we can all start playing with that. And then we'll you know we'll see like uh, you know how much work it looks like it needs from there. But I, I hope not too much. It's like pretty close to being feature complete at this point. It's pretty close to being like you know all the components for being like secure. So uh, yeah. yeah. So. 
another personal question for you. Um, is there anything that you know now, after being on this journey for about two years, that you kind of really wish you knew at the beginning? I mean, like, uh, the whole thing. I mean, like, uh, I, I, I think, you know, when we started the company anyway, we were just like, let's go start a company. Like, we, we, we can figure it out. Um, but there's so much, like, that we've learned along the way, so much I've learned along the way. Everything from, you know, like, fundraising to, like, you know, uh, having a team to, like, prioritizing different parts of the company to, like, working with candidates. And, and like, there's just... I think the startup structure lends itself pretty well to, like, learning these things because, like, you kind of learn these skills as the startup grows. But, like, yeah, there's just, like, so many, like, different things related to startup culture and startups I've learned. And as a, as a technical founder, right, this, this, it's kind of like you have to learn all of this really fast, gap to speed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually on that same kind of trajectory um, of things you wish you'd learned, uh, what do you think your, your biggest lessons have been? Oh, biggest lessons. I, I, I think one is just like always just kind of like asking for help and like, you know, uh, using our advisors and investors because like, you know, they've seen things like this happen a lot of times, like... You know, I can, like, spend a lot of time thinking about, like, my intuitions behind something, and I think that's, like, important to remember your intuitions when you're doing something like this, but, like, at the same time, just going to someone who, like, you know, knows all this stuff already and, like, bringing in all these different great voices into the picture is, like, super important to uh, being effective and... Yeah, definitely. One of the ways we wish we can help too. So, as a as a uh, uh, investor in Coda, um, we'd love to help you in the operational journey and give you some guidance where we can. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, actually, uh, last question for you, and then we'll open up some audience Q and A. If any of you guys have any questions, um, you having fun? Yeah, it's it's been it's it's been a blast, and I could clarify that with like you know sometimes are really hard and sometimes are like really great, but like in total, it's just been great. I think that's kind of the promise and the excitement, actually, of this industry. Um, when I think about it, too, and by the way, that's a total, like, ripoff of uh, Fred Wilson, who asks every founder and investor he interviews if they're having fun. I think it's a great question in general. Um, but for me, this space is just incredibly exciting. There's so much innovation occurring. There's so many new efforts being tried. Uh, there's a lot of unknown technical challenges. And what you guys are doing is differentiated. It's very unique. And so I'm very excited to see you guys take this on. And I think it's important that we face all those challenges holistically and uh, make sure we're having fun in the process. Thank you. Yeah, we're really excited to see it. Awesome. Here, so. Yeah. So, Evan Shapiro, let's actually open it up to audience Q&A, if we have any questions. Hi, my, uh, my name is Patrick. I have a quick question, um, more about ad developer adoption. I think a lot of people have seen that as like one of the big momentum pieces of how different networks have grown to like have like this crazy cult following that they have. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about some of your plans of how to like actually engage these developers, given that, you know, like, Honestly, there's a lot of different options right now of a lot of different platforms that are much more proven uh, than Coda, even though there are like obviously great um, op like opportunity in building on top of Coda. But I just want to know how you were thinking through that. Yeah, I think it's a great question, actually. Um, so I, the way I think about it right now is like there's like this core audience of crypto developers that are like we definitely want to engage with and are really important. But I'm also excited about all the developers that like aren't into cryptocurrency yet. I think like the barriers to getting started in cryptocurrency have been super high. So if we can reduce that with Coda, we can go after like a new audience of developers that like, you know, maybe like aren't gonna like spend like a year to like learn all the ins and outs of like a new programming language and everything. But you know, they wanna do a hackathon, they wanna do like a side project. And if we give them something that makes it easy, maybe they can build something really awesome. Uh, yeah. So. so, right over here. Uh, yeah, um, so you talked a bit about how uh, basically you don't need to download like the entire blockchain anymore. Basically, you just need to download this proof, right? Yep. And like that really makes it a lot easier for you to run like a full note on your phone or something, right? Um, I'm curious about how this technology also impacts like time to consensus in terms of blocks, because like it's it's great that the blocks are like a lot smaller, but you still have to like get everybody on board with the transactions, right? Like how how does consensus, I guess, work in this system? Yeah, so um, it, it's kind of interesting because consensus is kind of separate from the um, succinct blockchain itself. So we can kind of switch out whatever we want for that. We're going with proof of stake right now, um, in particular Ouroboros proof of stake. Um, and that's great because it means that the block time is fixed. It's like a fixed period of seconds, which makes it very predictable when a new block is going to come out. Um, and you're, you're right, by the way, that like 
even though like we're no longer limited by block size in terms of like blockchain growth, we're still limited in terms of like what the network throughput is. So the parameters to consider are like what is like you know the node that you want to support that has like the lowest um, upload speed, and then like what are the properties of your gossip network? And if you look at that, you still have like a lot of room to play with. You can still get into like you know very high throughputs um, because you don't have to worry about all these other ex extraneous factors about block size. A quick follow up on that. I'm glad, glad we brought up consensus mechanisms. Um, can it, it seems like to operate as a validator on this network, you actually do need to have the state of the network so you can independently verify the transactions that are rolled up into this ZK snark. Correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we we still have some other set of validators with the entire history of the blockchain that are. Oh, yep. Good. <laughs> so it's it's still a little better than other cryptocurrencies because they don't need the entire history of the blockchain. They only need whatever the current database is. So if you can imagine in a usual blockchain, like it's every transaction that has ever happened like forever and just keeps growing and growing. With, with Coda, you only need the current database. So given a certain number of accounts, it's like you, you just need to download those accounts. And you need to download like the deltas between um, you know, whatever database you had and whatever the new database is, which is way smaller than like every transaction that's ever happened. And so to go technical again for a moment, um, this also means that uh, if you are onboarding yourself on Dakota, you only need the most recent ZK snark, but you also need to make sure that somebody's not giving you a false ZK snark. So there's this issue of like how do you how do you how do you verify that what somebody's telling you is actually like the true and legitimate chain? And so you have to go out of protocol to get that information somewhere. Is that true? This is like the the weak no. subjectivity argument. Okay. So okay. so okay. Let, let's let's. Uh, so when you have a zero knowledge proof, you know that all the data behind it is um, correct. You know that whatever the zero knowledge proof is saying, the current strength is, the current ledger hash, whatever, it's all correct. Um, so what you can do is just as how on a normal blockchain, you stay online to collect different blockchains to compare the strengths of them. You stay online to collect different zero knowledge proofs and see what the strengths of them are. And then after you've done that and you've waited a sufficient amount of time to get all the strongest um, zero knowledge proofs, you know that you have the correct strongest um, uh, state of the worlds. So you don't need to, um, it's just all done on the gossip net, same as any other blockchain. Okay, but you, have to wait, you have to wait a little bit of time to make sure that you're, you're seeing all the different possible uh, states that are out there. Yeah, uh, but, but, and then you have to look at like the properties of your gossip net and see like how good your randomness is over who you're connecting to and, and see what the likelihood is that you'll get all the, yep. a certain amount of time and it's pretty fast. To, okay, so. great. Uh, any other questions? Um, thanks for coming in today. Great talk. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm curious. I think a lot of people would agree that like protocol development and improving the protocols that are out there is sort of one of the more important things you can do in in uh, bringing about blockchain adoption. Um, but it's a little tricky because oftentimes there isn't money in developing a protocol. And so I'm curious how O1 Labs plans to sustain itself into the future, uh, given that you guys are focused on protocol development. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like the main thing for the company is like ha having like a, a small and reasonable amount of the protocol and that like incentivizes the company to like, you know, both A, build it in the first place and then like uh, be able to like keep building it afterwards. Um, yeah. Is it, is it, yeah. There we go. So, hey, Alex, uh, great. Talk, awesome, thanks for coming in. I had a question around, um, when you first started looking at this technology, um, did you consider the feasibility of using it as a layer two protocol to like verify Bitcoin or verify Ethereum? Um, is that feasible to like have you know, some kind of uh, trust, not, even, not, not a trusted third party verifying the blockchain network where you could have like the Bitcoin Genesis node and then somehow use ZK snarks to verify, to prove that you have the latest version of, of another blockchain. Yeah, so we, we definitely considered it. The, the issue is that, I, I, I think I mentioned this very briefly earlier, is that if you were to use like the hash uh, function and like the signature scheme from like another cryptocurrency, it's gonna be very slow inside of a snark. So if you wanna create a proof of like a blockchain since Genesis, it's not gonna be efficient to do so with an existing cryptocurrency because they've made certain decisions around their cryptographic primitives that aren't efficient. You could think additionally, like maybe you could make this as like a side chain on top of another blockchain, but then you would still have to download the base blockchain to get access to the side chain. So we really wanted to build something that was doing this at like a base consensus level, because then that's where you get the most advantages um, when we were thinking about the construction for it. Thank you.
Okay. Well, everybody, thanks. Thanks, Evan, for coming in. This was great. Uh, loved having you. Thanks, everyone.